بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا الحمد لله Continuing with our journey through good Islamic manners and etiquettes pertaining to a variety of areas in our Islamic life we're talking today about something which is extremely important and often the time we think we know the subject but we don't or we do know the subject and we tend to forget to implement these matters pertaining to these great mannerisms and etiquettes required in this subject area which is manners related to reciting the Quran manners related to reciting the Quran so as you can imagine without me even having to say anything when we talk about the Quran anything which is to do with the Quran is extremely important and extremely imperative for us to implement and to know so the first thing that we have to consider with regards to our interaction with the Quran in terms of our mannerisms towards the Quran is our sincerity towards the Quran why because obviously it's such an important act of worship and so beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we live with the Quran we recite the Quran we you know implement the Quran in our lives and it has so much reward as we know the Prophet said man harfa min kitabillah falahu biha ashra that whoever reads one letter of the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has due to that one letter of reading 10 rewards the Prophet said I'm not saying to you that alif la meme is one letter rather alif un harf wa lam un harf wa meme un harf rather alif is a harf and lam is a harf and meme is a meme is a harf all of them are individual letters so by saying alif lam meme you get 30 rewards as mentioned in the hadith of the prophet so this is such a rewardable and beautiful and important act of worship and if that be the case then we have to ensure that we have sincerity with regards to its recitation with regards to worshiping with it with regards to learning it with regards to teaching it with regards to spreading its meanings etc 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 because if we don't have sincerity then we're going to lose this beautiful act of worship the rewards which are associated with it so what is sincerity just to remind ourselves i'm sure you know but just a reminder imam ibn qayyim rahimahullah ta'ala in his book madar jasalikin he mentioned he said al ikhlas wa alla tatlab ala amlika shahidan ghayr allah wa la mujaziyan siwahu that you do not seek with regards to your actions particular in particular what we're talking about reciting the Quran and in general any other act of worship you do not seek with regards to the act that you are doing the act of worship somebody to witness it other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala nor do you seek anyone to reward it other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so when you do the act of worship the Quran you're only doing it for the pleasure of Allah you don't care who's listening to you you don't care who's in front of you that doesn't change your attitude towards the Quran whatsoever even if you're the only person situated on an island you would still recite the Quran and contemplate the Quran and live with the Quran in the same way why because the only witness that you require and that you are seeking for this beautiful act of worship is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he is the only one that you are asking reward from you're not asking it from the creation you want don't want the creation to thank you to come up to you say what a beautiful voice you have how amazing you recite the Quran how much understanding you have to, of the Quran how great your memory is etc etc no it's all being done for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so this is the first thing we have to have ikhlas and this is something we will fight ourselves till the moment we die we have to fight with our souls for ikhlas because shaitan will always come and whisper to our souls don't you feel good when people you know listen to your recitation or hear you explain the Quran or know that you have memorized the Quran all these whispers will always come and try to elevate our soul but rather we have to control it and ensure that we are only doing it for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so if we have the wrong intention then it's a disaster and it destroys all of the beautiful rewards we know that in Sahih Muslim the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam he said in the long hadith inna awwal nasi yuqda yawm al qiyamati alayhi that the first person or the first group of people to be punished on the day of judgment will be the following rajulun ustushhida a person that was martyred in the cause of Allah we know that being martyred in the cause of Allah is one of the greatest acts of worship that can ever be done to give your life for the sake of Allah's pleasure and preserving the religion is from the greatest acts of worship that can be done so the first person that's going to be punished is person that martyred themselves apparently in the sake of Allah so this person will be brought forward and he will be made to recount his blessings and he will recount them and it will be said to him what did you do with regards to the blessings that you had it will be said I've, the man will say 
I fought in your way, I fought and strove in your way, O Allah, until I became a martyr. It will be said to him, Rather you have lied. Rather you fought so that the people will say, Look how brave this person is. And rather that was said about you. It was said in the dunya that you were brave. And then the person will be commanded to be dragged on his face until he's thrown in the hellfire. So this person, though he had a huge act of worship, apparently, but because his internal intention was incorrect, it was to say that he was, he wanted the people to say that he was brave and amazing things like that. And it was said, so his reward is wasted. He doesn't get reward and he's thrown into the hellfire. A next person will be brought and this is the one, القرآن, a person that learnt knowledge, that taught knowledge and learnt knowledge and he read the Quran. And then he will be brought. And it will be mentioned to him all of his blessings. And he will recognize these blessings and admit to them. And he will be said, what did you do with these blessings? He said, this man, I learned knowledge and I taught knowledge and I read the Quran for your pleasure. It will be said to him, rather you have lied. But rather you learnt this knowledge so that it will be said about you that you are a great scholar. And you read the Quran so that it will be said about you that you are a great reciter. And that was said. And then this person will be commanded to be dragged on his face until he's thrown into hellfire. And the hadith continues. But look at the point that we're trying to concentrate on this beautiful act of worship this great act of worship that has so much rewarded it if we don't get the first mannerism and etiquette correct with regards to it which is that we have to have sincerity then our deeds they go to waste so it's imperative that whenever we're reciting quran learning quran teaching quran explaining quran implementing quran and so many other uh, aspects with regards to the quran then we have to ensure that it's all done for the sake of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala طيب. The second etiquette regarding the Quran is applying the teachings of the Quran. And this is truly one of the greatest objectives, right? One of the greatest greatest objectives of the Quran is to apply that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has guided us to in his glorious book, in his glorious guidance. We shouldn't pick and choose that which we like. Yani we implement parts of it and leave parts of it. We remember parts of it and forget another part of it. No. Nothing should take precedence in terms of guidance and importance over and above what's in the Quran and the Sunnah. Because this is legislation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and the Quran is the uncreated speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He reprimands in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, those who were found to be picking and choosing from their scriptures, like the Jews, they would pick and choose. Right, the Bani Israel, that which they liked, they would and was easy for them and fit in with their schedule of life, so to speak, they would implement. And that which went against their likes and desires or was difficult for them, they would change the meanings of that or they would cause that particular passage to be lost. So Allah says about them in the Quran, Afatu'minuna bi ba'dil kitabi wa takfuruna bi ba'd. Do you believe in some of the book and you reject some of it or you have disbelief in some of it so what is the reward for whoever does that that they believe in part of the book and reject part of the book except that they will be ruined and they will have um, humiliation in this world and on the day of judgment they will be brought to the severest forms of punishment and Allah is not unaware of what you do this horrible thing that you are doing, believing in part of the book, part of the revelation, and leaving part of it, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not unaware of that. So you see people today, for example, they pick and choose the laws of the Quran that they want. The laws that fit with their society or fit with their inclinations and likes and dislikes, they will implement that. But the laws that they find difficult or they find, you know, in their minds it's going to embarrass us, make us look strange or whatever strange thoughts they have in their minds, then they choose not to implement that part of the Quran and they choose to forget it or misinterpret it etc rather the believers are not like that they apply all of the teachings of the Quran as much as they are able to physically do so in Bukhari the Prophet وسلم, saw in a dream and the Prophet dreams were true he saw in a dream about something a punishment which was going to take place in the hereafter so he came across a man 
yustakhu ra'suhu farajun allamahu Allah al-Qur'an he saw a man whose head was being split open with a rock continually right and in the dream it was explained to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam what this was so it was mentioned him to mention to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam that this person whose head is being split open continually time after time with a rock it's a person that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught him the Quran فَنَامَ عَنْهُ بِاللَّيْلِ وَلَمْ يَعْمَلْ فِيهِ بِالنَّهَارِ So this person wouldn't worship the, with the Qur'an in the nights, nor would he act upon the Qur'an during the day. يُفْعَلُوا بِهِ إِلَى يَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ So this punishment is going to be upon this person until the Day of Judgment. Okay, why is this such a severe punishment? Because the person chose to turn away from the Qur'an. The person didn't implement the Qur'an in his life. The Sahaba radiyallahu anhum, the companions of the Prophet وسلم, they were the complete polar opposite of this. They would be guided by the Qur'an and they would stop at its injunctions, stop at its borders, whatever, wherever the Qur'an tells you to stop, they would stop. Wherever the Qur'an tells you or orders you to move, they would move. No matter what the cost would be and no matter how difficult it would be for them. Why is this the case that they interacted in such a manner? Because they truly lived in the shade of the Qur'an. They loved to recite the Qur'an. They loved to be with the Qur'an. They understood that it was the uncreated speech of their Lord the Lord of all that exists, so they love to hear the Qur'an, they love to implement the Qur'an, they love to contemplate the Qur'an, right? Take for example, there's a time in Medina, before the verses came down, to prohibit alcohol. A lot of the people, they used to enjoy drinking alcohol, that was from their culture, they would drink a lot of alcohol. When the verses of the Qur'an came down to, re, to uh, make the, the khamr, the alcohol haram, those that were drinking alcohol, as soon as they heard that, the, that it's now been haram, they didn't even put the cups to their lips to finish what was in their cups. Rather, they threw the cups straight away on the floor. And they ordered that whatever they had in their barrels of storage of alcohol be destroyed. So you found that the streets of Medina were filled with alcohol flowing. As soon as they heard that there is a verse which is now prohibiting alcohol, at that moment, without any discussion, without any argumentation, as soon as they heard it, they threw away all of the alcohol and they never ever again returned to it. This is how the Qur'an would mix with their souls. The Qur'an for them was like a remote control. The Qur'an says, go, they go. The Qur'an says, stop, they say, stop. Stand, stand, sit, sit, be quiet, be quiet, speak, speak. This is how they were with the commands of the Qur'an and the Prophet It really did mix with their soul and with their minds. Today, you find that if somebody like I said, see something in the Qur'an that they don't particularly like, they're going to try and find and look for a way to come out of that injunction. They're going to strive as much as they can to find something that in their minds will allow them to not act upon that instruction in the Qur'an. And this is a real sad reality that we, instead of loving the Qur'an and taking it as the ultimate source of guidance and happiness and joy and protection in this world and the next, we take it as something that we can pick and choose. So we resemble those from the Jews of Bani Israel where the Prophet, where Allah said, Do you believe in part of the book and reject part of the book, right? And then they get khizyu dunya, they get, uh, then they get khizyun fi dunya, they get um, humiliated in this world due to that. So we shouldn't be like that. Taib, a third etiquette pertaining to the Quran is that we are consistent in reciting and learning the Quran, right? It's not that we look upon the Qur'an only once in a while. No, we have to be consistent with it. So like we're addicted to, to, to the phones, literally we are addicted. We're always looking for the next uh, bling, the next bleep, the next message, who's messaged us, who's liked us, who's responded to my particular post, etc., etc. We're always with the phone. Every hour, I reckon, it's at least 10 times is the norm, right? Looking at the phone. This is how we're supposed to be with the Qur'an. If we were with the Qur'an, at least five minutes every hour of the day you would change you would see that our lives and our interaction with the Quran would change our souls would be so much better and the Quran if you don't recite it consistently and you don't keep up with your learning of the Quran the Quran you will forget it that's the nature of the Quran because in Bukhari Muslim the Prophet ﷺ said that the likeness of the companion of the Quran is the likeness of the companion of a camel, the one who owns a camel that is tied up. In ahada alayha amsakaha. If this person takes care of this camel and ties it up regularly in a safe manner, 
then the camel will remain. However, of course, if the person leaves the camel, doesn't take care of it, then the camel will run away. And likewise, the Quran. If you're with the Quran consistently, regularly, then the Quran is going to stay with you and be a part of your soul and a part of your life. But if you don't have that continual interaction with the Quran, then the Quran is not going to have that impact in your life and it's not going to stay in your memories and in your chests and in your souls. So we, our souls, once we go through the difficult stages of purification via correct worship and correct learning, correct knowledge, this purification, it makes that our soul will be more attached with the Quran. And that's why Uthman radiallahu anhu, he said, لَوْ طَحَرَتْ قُلُوبُكُمْ مَا شَبِعَتْ مِنْ كَلَامِ اللَّهِ That had your hearts been pure, they would not have found enough. They would never find their fill from the recitation of the Book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the more the hearts become pure, the more we act upon the worship and the knowledge, the more we will, we will find that we want to be with the Qur'an and that we want to run the, to the Qur'an for solace. That when we have free moments, we don't want to be on the phone or talking to people. Rather, we want to be with the Qur'an, revising it, memorizing it, learning it, studying it, teaching it, implementing it, reflecting upon it, upon it seeking solace with it seeking comfort with it. This is the nature of the soul that has become purified as, as Uthman radiallahu anhu said that had the hearts been pure, they would never have found enough of the Quran. They would never have had their fill of the Quran. طيب. The fourth thing is that if somebody is or ever finds themselves in a situation where they forget the Quran, there is something that they should say. Okay. It's like so. One night the Prophet ﷺ heard a man reciting a chapter of the Quran, and this is in Bukhari and Muslim. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Yarhamahullah, Lakad Adkarani Ayata Kada wa Kada Kuntu unsi tuha. The Prophet ﷺ said, May Allah have mercy upon this man. He reminded me of a verse from such and such place that I had forgotten in the Quran. Min surati kada wa kada. So not I had forgotten that I had been made to forget unsi tuha. So here is the point. The Prophet ﷺ, I was made, he said, I was made to forget a particular verse of the Quran. What does this mean? The ulama, they say that if a person says, I have forgotten the Quran, this is something which is disliked. But rather you should say, unsid to al-Quran. Allahumma dhikrni min al-Quran ma unsid. Oh Allah, rem remind me from the Quran that which I was made to forget. And what it means is not that Allah made you to forget it, but your situation that you found yourself in caused you to not have that interaction with the Qur'an as you should have had and that caused you to forget the Qur'an because if you say I forgot the Qur'an it means that you were lackadaisical with the Qur'an you were taking it easy you didn't visit the Qur'an as often as you should have and that was from your own choice but rather if you say unsitul Qur'an I forgot the Qur'an I was made to forget the Qur'an sorry then it means that it was due to your situation and it wasn't from your own choice and this is the mannerisms that we should have with the Qur'an that we don't leave the Qur'an unless it's something which is causing us to leave the Qur'an, a difficult situation. Also from that which makes us forget the Qur'an and hard to memorize the Qur'an and hard to be with the Qur'an is the number of sins that we commit. As I mentioned, the more the soul is purified, the more you will find that you are able to be with the Qur'an. Why? Because the Qur'an is the most pure thing in this creation, in this existence, in this universe. So the vessel that contains the Qur'an has to also be purified and pure. That's why Imam Shafi'i rahimahullah ta'ala, one of the great Imams of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, a very famous Imam of Islam and very knowledgeable, his memory used to be so strong to the extent that he could photographically memorize what he would look at. Therefore, he would have to cover the left page of a book to ensure that he memorizes the right page before the left page. Had he looked upon the left page, he would have memorized the left page before the right page. That's how strong his memory was gifted to him. Taib, one time he was walking and the wind had blown and in front of him was a woman so the wind blew to the extent that the woman's ankle just her ankle was exposed and of course Imam Shafi didn't look upon it with intent she happened to be in front of him and he said due to that I, I, I noticed something in my memory that my memory on that particular day became weak so I complained to my teacher Rabia and he said this poetry shakawtu illa waqi uh, sorry waqi not Rabia shakawtu illa waqi su'a hifdi فأرشدني إلى ترك المعاصي. He said, I complained to Waqi about the poor nature of my memorization on that day. So Waqi, his teacher, Imam Shafi's teacher, guided him by to say, leave alone sins, stay far away from sins. وأخبرني بأن العلم النور. And he told me 
that knowledge is a light. And the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not given to the sinful person. Okay? So the more we purify ourselves, the more we will find that we can memorize the Qur'an, that we can retain the Qur'an, that we can contemplate the Qur'an, that we can worship the Qur'an, and it won't be something which is difficult upon us. So it's imperative that we purify the souls. طيب, a fifth and very important matter, etiquette pertaining to Qur'an, is that we have to contemplate the meanings, right? The Sahaba radiallahu anhum, and you know, we have to reiterate this time and time again, if you want, if you want to understand Islam in the proper manner, you have to really go back to the first three generations of Muslims, the Sahaba and their students and their students, the Tabi'in wa Taba' Tabi'in. Okay, because the Prophet said, خَيْرُ النَّاسِ قَنِّي ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ The best of generations is my generation, meaning the Prophet and the companions. ثُمَّ الَّذِينَ يَلُونَهُمْ Then those who follow them, then those who follow them. So the first three generations in Islam are the golden generation, right? They are the ones by which you have to look through the lens of Islam. If we want to truly understand Islam, we have to look through the lens of how the companions understood Islam and how the two generations after them understood Islam. Because today, we have very strange things that we are being told and being misguided with. Anyway, the Sahaba radiallahu anhum, they had a very interesting methodology when it came to memorizing the Qur'an. كَانُوا إِذَا تَعَلَّمُوا مِنَ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وَسَلَّمَ عَشْرَ عَيَاتٍ لَمْ يُجَاوِزُوهَا حَتَّى يَتَعَلَّمُوا مَا فِيهَا That the companions radiallahu anhum when they would learn 10 verses from the Prophet ﷺ, they wouldn't go beyond those 10 verses until they knew everything that was in those ma fiha min al-ilm wal-amal. They wouldn't go beyond those 10 verses until they knew what was in there from knowledge and what was required of them to act upon. Right? So they would take 10 verses, learn the detailed knowledge of those 10 verses, and act upon them in their lives, and then they would go to the next. فَتَعَلَّمْنَا الْقُرْآنَ وَالْعِلْمْ وَالْعَمَلْ جَمِيعًا so they said we learn the Quran and knowledge and action all together as one thing, as one package. Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, for example, he took eight years to memorize Surah Al-Baqarah, right? And today we have people that memorize it very quickly, memorize it in two months, which is something beautiful and recommended if you can do it. But how many of them actually understand what they're memorizing? And we're saying that contemplating the Qur'an, the meanings of the Qur'an, is one of the greatest mannerisms and etiquettes that we need to have with the Qur'an. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah 38, verse 29. It is a book that we have revealed unto you. Blessed this book is. Why? So that you can contemplate, reflect, internalize its meanings. And so that the people of intellect, they can remember, remember what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the guidance that Allah brings. So that's the whole point of the Qur'an. أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ أَمْ عَلَىٰ قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Allah says elsewhere, who's making this noise? Put it away please. Is it, if أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ Allah says in the Qur'an, do they not contemplate over the Qur'an or do they have locks upon their hearts? So the whole purpose of the Qur'an, after worshipping with it, and whilst worshipping with it is to contemplate on it and to implement it in our lives. Deep contemplation of the Qur'an increases us in, in Iman and true knowledge. So you'd find that the Salaf radiallahu anhum, the Sahaba and those after them, the righteous and even till today some of them, when they worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example in their night prayers where they have a long prayer where they may pray for up to three hours enjoying that communication that they have with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you will find that some of them will take a passage of the Qur'an or just even a verse of the Qur'an and they would continually repeat that and reflect upon the meanings of the Qur'an, of that particular passage and that particular verse. And this was the way of the Prophet Sallallahu and many of the companions عنهم, for hours and hours standing, worshipping Allah and contemplating upon just one passage or one verse of the Qur'an. And to us, of course, we can't understand why, but once our Iman increases, our knowledge increases, we can also become like that. Inshallah, where the hearts will be attached and um, you know addicted to the sweetness of the Quran and the meanings of the Quran. طيب, another important etiquette to mention, number six, is the permissibility of reciting the Quran while one is standing or walking or riding or sitting. Meaning you can read the Quran in any posture that you are in, as long as it's not a posture which is considered to be a posture of you know where you can disrespect the Quran. 
So Allah says in the Quran, in, in uh, Surah 3, verse 191, Those who remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala whilst they are standing, or they are sitting, or they are on their sides. So Allah is, yani Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is praising these people that they remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in all situations. So like people are attached to the Quran, uh, sorry, attached to their phones in all situations. The blessed ones are attached to the Quran in all situations. You find them murmuring to themselves and they're not murmuring, they're reciting the Quran as they're walking. I even saw one person, he used to jog with the Quran and he would have the Quran in his hands, subhanAllah. As he's jogging, he's reciting from the Quran. So people, they listen to the Quran often, they recite the Quran often in all different situations and this is how we want to be like the chosen people of the Quran. And it's mentioned in Bukhari from Abdullah ibn Mughaffal radiyallahu anhu that the Prophet sallallahu on uh, Yawm al-Fatih when the Prophet sallallahu was given the victory to conquer Mecca he was um, seen riding his camel and, or his riding beast and he would be reciting Surat al-Fatih إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ So he was reciting this as he was riding, right? And also the Prophet sallallahu as mentioned by Aisha radiyallahu anha that the Prophet sallallahu would at times put his head on her lap and read the Qur'an. So you can read the Qur'an whilst you're standing, whilst you're sitting, whilst you're lying down, whilst you're walking. However, you should be, of course, focused on what you're doing. Don't read the Qur'an while you're boxing, for example, or doing an aerobics class. You're not going to be focused on what you're doing. طيب. A very important etiquette, which is number seven, is that only the purified can touch the Qur'an, meaning that only those who are away from major, major impurity, yani, uh, they are they are free of sexual impurity. They've made the ghusl after having sex, or they've made the ghusl after having finished their menstruation. If they're in that situation, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah 56, okay, verse 79, لا يمسه إلا المطهرون. That none can touch it or should touch it except for those who are pure, purified, right? تَنزِيلُ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That which is sent down from your Lord, meaning the Qur'an, the revelation. Because some of the scholars of, Qur of the Seed, they took it to be that this refers to the Lawh al-Mahfud, the book which is in the heavens, right? And uh, But others, they said no, because it says تَنزِيلُ مِنْ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ That which is descended from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then it refers to the Qur'an. And that is the opinion of the majority. And also, the Prophet sallallahu sent a letter to Amr ibn Hazm. And in the letter it said, Allah yamasil Quran illa tahirun, that none should touch the Quran except one who is pure. And this letter, as mentioned by Imam Ibn Abdul Bar, one of the great scholars of Hadith and Islam, he said that the this letter is so well known that it doesn't even need a chain of narration like the hadiths, they need a chain of narration. That it's such a well known letter and it's so understood that it was from the Prophet. So in summary, that before the person touches the Qur'an, they have to be in a state of purity, that they have to be free from that which is, so they have to be free from that which a ghusl is required for. So if they fall into the situation where they need a ghusl, they have to do ghusl first and then they are allowed to touch the Qur'an. With regards to minor impurity, the minor impurity, what we mean by minor impurity is that which you require wudu for. For example, if you pass urine or uh, any visit to the bathroom, if you fall asleep, if you eat camel's meat, but uh, if you you know take that opinion, if you touch uh, somebody with um, desire, it breaks your wudu, right? So these things in this situation, the minor impurity, you you can recite, you can recite the Quran from memory. You can recite the Quran from memory if you are in a situation of minor impurity, because Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu once went to go and reveal, relieve, uh, relieve himself. And this is in the Muwatta of Imam Malik. And when he came back, before he made wudu, he was seen reciting the Quran from, you know, from the top of his head, from his memory. So a person said to him, O oh, leader of the believers, you are doing this without having made wudu. So Umar said to him, well, who told you that uh, a person cannot do this? Was it the misguided sect? He mentioned a misguided sect like Musaylama. Was it him that told you that you can't do it? And he rebuking the person, saying that this is something which is well known, that a person that is in minor impurity that which requires wudu can recite the Quran from their memory if they wish to do so. Uh, a point here to mention that is it better to recite the Quran from memory or is it better to recite the Quran by looking at the Quran? So the scholars they said in summary that if you get more contemplation and more tranquility by reciting it from your memory, then recite it from your memory. 
However, if you get more contemplation and tranquility from reciting it from the book, then recite it from the book. And the third case, if they're both the same, then recite by looking at the book. Why? Because then you're going to get the extra reward of looking at the book and you won't fall into the um, the warning which was mentioned in the Quran upon the tongue of the Prophet Sallallahu The Prophet Sallallahu will complain on the Day of Judgment to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that, Oh my Lord, the people took the Quran as something to be left alone. They abandoned the Quran. So if you never look at the Quran, you may fall into this dislike that the Prophet Sallallahu is going to mention on the Day of Judgment. That's why they said. If it's equal with you in terms of reciting from your memory or reciting from the Quran is equal for you in terms of your tranquility and concentration, then it's better to recite from the book rather than the memory and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. طيب. A tenth one which we'll stop at inshallah because there's going to be a part two to this due to the uh, numerous amount of benefits there are with regards to the um, recitation and the mannerisms of the Quran. Uh, actually, it's not number 10 because I missed a few out, so I believe it's number 8. In any case, the next and important etiquette that we're going to take today before we stop is that it's recommended to clean your mouth with the miswak or something similar before you recite the Quran. Because this is having good manners with the Quran, it's showing you, not it's showing you, it's it's you are showing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala how much you value the Quran and how much you realize how pure the Quran is and how deserving of care and concern that the Quran requires right that before you even recite the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala you try to ensure that your mouth is pure with the miswak or anything similar to that the Prophet ﷺ, in the hadith of Hudayfa kana Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam idha qama min that the Prophet sallallahu when he would get up in the night to worship to worship to pray to Allah azza wa jal he would clean his mouth with the siwak and from that the ulama they took that it's good to clean your mouth with sawak. Why? Because you're going to be reciting lots of Quran when you get up in the night and you pray. So in all situations, it's good to clean your mouth with the siwak and even more important when you get up in the night to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And listen to this amazing hadith. In the Sahih al-Jami' of uh, Shaykh al-Albani rahimahullah ta'ala, may Allah have mercy upon his soul, he mentioned this authentic hadith. إِذَا قَامَ أَحْدَكُمْ يُصَلِّ مِنَ اللَّيْلِ The Prophet ﷺ said, if one of you gets up and prays in the night, فَلْيَسْتَكْ then let the person use the miswak. For verily one of you, if they pray in the salah, meaning they read in the salah Quran, an angel comes close and puts their mouth close to the mouth of the person that is reciting the Quran. And nothing will come out of the person that is reciting the, the Quran in that worship except that we will go into the mouth of the angel. As a, as a form of glorifying this act of worship that is taking place, right? So it's imperative that, as the Prophet ﷺ mentioned in both ahadith, that the person, they clean their mouth in the night when they recite the Qur'an. And, of course, in any other time and place, if they are reciting the Qur'an, they should try to do the same. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. We'll stop here, inshallah. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.